Okay. So this uh, second class uh, about in the second class about need funding, we'll see some uh, other examples of techniques uh, that we may use. So right, uh, yesterday we uh, basically discussed uh, the observation methods. Okay. So what are the techniques for trying to get information about uh, uh, the behavior, the habits uh, of the users? Uh, and uh, uh, trying to guess at, at least uh, uh, what are the um, opportunities for improving so some parts of activity that they are not doing maybe in the best way or some parts where we can help them uh, we see them struggle with some task with some activities and so we can go uh, go towards them and ask them what uh, uh, what's wrong with them what's, dif what's difficult for them what's uh, painful what are the, their main, um, let's say, concerns about uh, uh, how they are doing work. And uh, um, it's uh, surprising that uh, uh, sometimes you find that, that the, uh, the final, uh, let's say, problems of the user is are totally different uh, from the ones uh, uh, you initially th uh, think or thought. Um, I will tell you a, a story at the end, but first we need to to cover all the different uh, the other different topics. Okay, so but uh, of course this observation is one of the many uh, techniques. Uh, there are uh, several other techniques we are going to uh, to see in a bit more detail some of them, um, and uh, in particular we start by uh, talking about diaries. Hmm? Uh, diaries is uh, let's say the opposite of observation where in observation you are trying to um, you know uh, understand what people are doing and how are they doing that without trying to interfere in any way uh, or with their normal work uh, and so actually it's very light for the users they don't need to do anything okay we say okay probably they need to answer some questions during the task or after the task but uh, um, Apart from that, they are not uh, changing the way they are acting uh, normally. But that requires you to go there, you or some person, to go there and spend time with each user individually. Okay, So it can be uh, very expensive. It's not uh, scalable in, in some way. On the other hand, uh, we could think about, uh, um, say, <laughs> uh, charging the user with the task of uh, describing their tasks, describing their activities. And so we can ask the user to, um, to keep a diary. And it's special if we want to observe people over, over longer periods of time, maybe weeks. Oh, um, and uh, uh, we cannot, of course, uh, have a, an observer you know, living with a person for several weeks. And so if we want to observe the user in, in a long period of time uh, and while they are doing their you know, normal life and or normal work, um, the user themselves should be able to, to, to check their activities and take notes of their activities. And uh, these diaries are basically, uh, what, the, what the name says, a, a paper diary or an app-based, computer-based diary where the user needs to take note of some of their actions. Okay, not everything they do, of course, but everything related to the kind of task or to the kind of uh, application domain that we are trying to explore. And so uh, ideally the user will come to you and have a list of uh, uh, the action, the relevant action they did, uh, maybe at different uh, hours of the days uh, uh, and with, so with timestamps and with the activity. Um, so, for example, if we are interested in something about, uh, you know, uh, just to continue the example of yesterday, a student uh, uh, in uh, university students while studying, uh, maybe in the diary, the student could say, okay, I started at this hour, I, I finished at this hour to study, I got distracted one, two, five times, uh, uh, it was productive, it wasn't, and so on. Okay, so some small information uh, about, uh, in this case, uh, the study dimension of the person, not, not everybody, okay? Not, sorry, not everything. So you don't need to know uh, about uh, what it was cooking if you are only interested in the studying activity and so on. But this, of course, requires an effort and uh, from the from from the user 
okay the user should accept to keep track of what they are doing for several days in a row and uh, and share that with you so uh, for doing that of course uh, you should uh, we should invent some motivation mechanism so it's not just uh, you know please do that or please let me observe your day uh, and live with you one day and while I observe what you're doing but uh, actually people are are asked to do something active to um, to to pay attention to what they are doing and keep track of that so it's a it's an extra effort and they will not do just uh, for your pleasure okay so in many cases uh, uh, studies involving diaries uh, have some sort of incentive at the end so you you are paying them hmm, in cash or you give him them some some gift or some benefit or maybe you have uh, at the end a, a raffle and then you extract randomly from one of the participants uh, um, uh, some kind of uh, of gift uh, for example or gadget or whatever so you should put some some resources in that it, on one hand you are saving in the resources of observers so you don't need people going there and observing but on the other hand of course you need to, to put these resources into the incentives for for the users and then what we do with these uh, uh, diaries okay uh, we'll, when these diaries will come back you will have a, a lot of uh, same detailed information from each of the users uh, and uh, at that point uh, uh, we can um, analyze what they wrote hmm? try to understand if there are patterns if there are difficulties if there are some special needs this can be done like we say here offline so to the reserve the researchers basically uh, sit down and read and try to uh, make a systematic uh, say analysis of what they write or so maybe they count they do some quantitative computation so how many study sessions what is the length uh, and so on they try to to extract numbers to extract quantitative measures and also extract uh, qualitative measures so what uh, uh, for example we when uh, when does it happen that a student mark a study session as not very productive? So can we spot a pattern? Can we show what happened before and so on? And at the end, we will have some more structured information, but most likely we will have a lot of more questions. Okay, so we we spot a pattern. You we 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 maybe see some hints of a, of a task that could be improved. Uh, but of course we cannot be sure because the only information we have is just what is written on the diary so usually after the observation through a diary after the analysis of the diaries usually we also make some interviews uh, um, just to ask for uh, clarifications ask for motivations of what they did and also ask for evaluation of, of, of what we can propose okay just question like uh, but would you like if we uh, provided you with this uh, application that uh, could help you in this way? So they can say yes or no, but it's a yes or no specific in a context in which they live. And this makes it uh, a bit uh, also difficult to schedule this interview because a good moment or an easy moment to schedule the interview is when they are sending the diary back. So you are maybe going there. Uh, giving them the diary, explaining what you expect from them, and then one week later you go there again and return and uh, say re, um, get the diary back with their notes. At that point, you are there with the person, and you could do a very short and simple interview. But at that point, you haven't analyzed the diary yet, so maybe the, the question you may ask in that moment are very shallow, are very general, because you, you haven't studied yet what is in the diary. It would be better to make it sometime, sometime, uh, sometime later after we analyze the the, the content. But uh, of course, it will require setting an extra an extra meeting, and it's not always possible. So, of course, yeah, like in every activity, there's a there are a lot of trade-offs. And uh, I just want to tell you one um, one example that we did uh, here in our in our department. Um, Alberto Monge, which is a, was a PhD student, he just got his PhD um, uh, some months ago here, and uh, a part of his research, uh, he wanted to uh, discover uh, how um, 
normal householders or so families, normal people living in the house uh, would feel about uh, uh, automating tasks uh, in their house. So imagining a smart home and the smart home should be programmable in some way uh, so that uh, when a given event happens, uh, then the smart home could do some sort of action in, in, in reaction for that. And so we prepared uh, many uh, nice looking booklets with nice colors and, and so, so something that was not scary, but was okay. We tried to make it friendly with the pen attached and so on. So this is the kind of diet that we, we gave to these people. And uh, we asked them, okay, throughout your day, just keep this into your pocket and do your life normally. But when you um, feel that you are doing some re repetitive action in your house, or you are, let's say, executing some routine. Okay, you are, uh, okay, it's evening, I need to close all the windows, or uh, I'm going away, I need to be sure that all the lights are switched off, and so on. So, in a way, you are, uh, you recognize there is a, that in your life, there is a specific condition that will lead to some actions to be carried by you. And so, please write them down. Write them down and try to describe me uh, what is the, trigger event so what is the moment in which you are prompted to do something and what are the actions the one action or more than one action that you would like to do in this moment so we are not asking you to design a smart home you're asking how you behave normally in your day and how you think about the tasks that you're doing and this will be information that we later be used to understand what kind of uh, of uh, actions a smart home system would do and what kind of complexity the system ha have in mind for the type of action. So it's uh, it's not important, for example, to build a smart home system which has a very complex sequences of actions or very complex maybe uh, description for the events when the user will never use that because the user will never think in that complex terms, uh, excluding nerds, of course, uh, uh, which are a special category for which uh, most uh, user studies don't apply. And um, okay, so that was a, a, a practical example. And uh, how it was conducted is that at the beginning of the week, uh, uh, Alberto went uh, to each of these people, okay, one by one, and gave them the booklet and explained them what uh, they were expected to do. Um, and at the at the end of the week, after one week, so it was not always on the same day because there were more than one. Um, at the end of the week, he, went, he just went there uh, to collect the booklets and have, have a small interview about uh, how they felt into that week. Uh, was it difficult? Was it easy? And what is the most, most important information they got? Uh, and so on. So very simple question. And then you collect the booklets. And after all the booklets were collected, uh, we had um, an, um, a random extraction of a gift uh, that was, if I remember correctly, that was a, um, you know, a connected a Wi-Fi speaker, a Sonos, uh, uh, so something that was was worth several hundreds of euros. Okay, so it was the motivation, one of the motivations uh, uh, for the, these people uh, to help with the with the with the study, apart from being friend with Alberto, so they wanted to help in any way. So this. Uh, a technique, and then of course we came back and uh, we analyzed the contents uh, of all these booklets, of course. And then, if you are interested, <laughs> you can read uh, the papers that we wrote after that. So there was one technique, very very particular, very strange, but in some contexts is is effective because in this case we don't want to observe a person for half an hour or for half a day. We need to observe the person for several days, and this is one of the of the few methods uh, that are applicable and scalable for that. Then uh, the other techniques uh, are, uh, which is quite important, but also quite dangerous, is uh, making interviews. Um, I ask users about what they need and what they want, OK? And my comment here is uh, what could possibly go wrong, OK? If I'm asking you about what you want, uh, well, the kind of answer I get uh, uh, is usually unrealistic uh, or just wishful thinking, or you are not maybe pointing me in the right direction. 
because what you really need uh, maybe is different uh, from what you think you want or what you say you want okay so there are three different levels the real need uh, what you think you need and what you say they would need that it will again be different but of course they are uh, um, an easy way to make a structured observation so even uh, having a, a repeatable instrument where you can um, interview in this case uh, many people hmm? um, interviews may be of two types two big types so in both cases we are asking questions to users and try to analyze their answers uh, the simplest form of interview is a survey so maybe an online survey or just an in-person survey with we have a, a set of predefined questions and the user has to have a a very short answer in many cases just checking a box or writing one sentence or a couple of words so uh, the set of question is identical for all the users and the possible answers in many cases are predefined uh, you can do it like on paper or online uh, but you see that uh, it's uh, very easy to to distribute it's very easy to scale it's very easy to parallelize, so you can give surveys to a lot of people at the same time, um, and it's very re repeatable. So every user will get exactly the same questions and will get exactly the same options for answering. So you can really put together the data, com do comparison, do averages, and so on. Uh, or something a bit deeper, in-person interviews, where uh, you go and speak to a person and these uh, in-person in interviews maybe where they start from a set of questions it's better to start them from a, a known set of questions but then you can uh, do follow-up questions uh, um, according to what they reply at the first time so you start with some standard set of questions and then you go deeper according to the, the responses that you get uh, it could be, uh, we'll see some details, uh, structure or unstructure. So unstructure is just, uh, okay, let's chat together for something or more structure with a set of questions that you need to ask in, some, in a given order, okay? Uh, both are have good and bad points because if in an unstructured interview, maybe some new aspects will come out just by chatting, just about a side uh, discuss discussion and that you didn't maybe uh, think uh, in a structured interview. And of course, uh, uh, the, the backside is that in unstructured interviews, uh, you may lose track of what you are talking about. Uh, you will come up with less, let's say, information because maybe the discussion went into different directions. Um, <clears throat> finally, uh, these interviews could be uh, individual. So we are interviewing one person at a time or with a group of people. And in this case, we talk more uh, about uh, focus groups uh, where you invite maybe five or eight or 10 people in a room and you do the question, you put the questions on the floor. Okay, so say, okay, what do you think about this? And everybody's free to speak. So they don't need to reply individually one by one. They just start, you are just starting a discussion with a question and they, are, they start replying and discussing among yourselves. And the, your role will be that of moderating the discussion and taking notes and extracting the information. So in this case, you have a more direct comparison of people with different opinions or different experiences. They will discuss and will help you, uh, you know, understand uh, how, which points uh, are uh, in a stronger agreement uh, and which are the points that are more controversial because different people have different uh, opinions. Mm -hmm. So, the, of course, for all of this, you need uh, some techniques for doing that. Okay, you need to <laughs> study a bit about the methodology, um, but then they can be applied quite easily and uh, without uh, a huge effort, without uh, you know, spending too many uh, days or involving too many people. But uh, uh, beware that uh, users uh, normally don't know what they want. There's a nice article here saying, stop asking users what they want. Uh, um, it's not that they, want, they don't want to reply. They maybe would like to reply, but uh, um, they don't maybe understand the question or they don't understand the situation, okay? 
if a person does this a task in the same way for five years, for 10 years, they will not see it uh, maybe as an opportunity to change because for them, it's so normal to do it in that way that they don't think about it anymore. So it will never come up that maybe it can be improved. Okay, so uh, maybe they know what they want at the subconscious level, but rationally they don't think it's relevant. So that's not important. Okay? People, you know, uh, when you ask something, they will filter the response. They only tell you what they think is important. What they think is important to you, which is even a second level filter. It should be important to them and they think it's also important to you. So it's very difficult to uh, you know, extract the information from people in a free way without them pre-selecting what they think uh, they should tell you. In many cases, they will try to tell you what they think you like to hear. And it's very um, dangerous bias because especially if you go there with and you already present an idea of what you want to do, uh, it's most likely that they, that they answers will uh, go towards your idea hmm? just because uh, they know that uh, you will like them. Okay. Uh, and so again, you are, mm, you know, there's no point in interviewing a mirror that will tell you what you already know or what you already think. You don't get any extra information. So you should be very careful not to tell them what, what, what you like or what would you expect them to answer. You, we, we want to have honest answers, not uh, you know, pleasing answers. Uh, it's also difficult for uh, new technologies or new products. Okay, um, if I go to a person and say and ask her, what do you think about you know uh, virtual reality, at, um, um, AR was uh, uh, augmented reality uh, interfaces for I don't know for for cooking, for studying, for traveling. And they never had the experience of augmented reality. What can they answer? Okay, it's very difficult. Uh, or it's all, or it's already difficult for a technical person to understand the capability of a new technology. Even if maybe you have some technical knowledge to understand how it works, but for an, a, a normal user, a non-technical person, how can they really know what? Uh, kind of application, what kind of interaction, what kind of actions, what, what will happen with that technology that they only heard about it. Hmm. Uh, so they will uh, just answer by grounding their answer to the, their current experiences. So without then taking into, into account the new technology or by, you know, uh, working freely with fantasy, okay. Uh, just an example, if I tell you, okay, if I want to, there are new sensors that can read the brain, brain waves. Okay, they, there are, okay. Uh, so there's a new field of brain computer interaction. Okay, so uh, do you think that an application uh, we're using brain computer interaction for, I don't know, for, uh, for choosing the, the movie to watch tonight uh, would be useful? And people will start thinking about uh, artificial intelligence that can read your mind and you read your thoughts and something like that, which, which is totally not the case, okay? Um, so we should never ask explicitly for a user to comment or to give their opinion about something they don't, they don't have direct experience with. Uh, after all, we are the technologies. So we know the technology, we know what we can do with the technology. The, um, the goal of the interviews is to uh, understand the user tasks. So not how the user will relate with technology. This is our job to construct the technology in a way that the user would like. We want to uh, know what the user would like, hmm? would like to do and not how. So also try to be uh, very careful not to hint about uh, new types of technologies okay we had a discussion this morning on slack about when we when should we take care of uh, defining the sensors and of course when you talk with the user you should totally leave out this kind of discussion because otherwise you are asking your in, in some way that your user to please you will uh, invent uh, some way in which they want to use the accelerometer for example 
which is totally irrelevant for them. They are just telling them that because they, they will make you happy. Um, and so uh, also they are not designer, they're not creative, the users, so you can not expect them to understand the new product. You should not even mention a product, okay? Um, and uh, and also it's difficult, uh, like we said at the beginning, they take uh, what they are doing already, they're taking it for granted. So this is the normal way of doing that. I always did it in this way. Why? Well, because, yes, because uh, I always did it in this way. Hmm? There's no maybe reasoning, uh, uh, it's just some habit that will get got, uh, you know, uh, fixed uh, during the years, hmm? during their, uh, their work or their activity. And so unless you spot that part of, you know, a behavior and you ask questions specifically about that, they will never, you know, uh, present it to you. They will never uh, mention that because for them it's, no, it's part of the background, okay? Uh, it's not something they need to talk about because it's just normal, like like breathing hair. Okay, you don't you don't uh, you don't. What are you doing? Uh, I'm lecturing. I would say in this moment, or maybe I'm sitting, but I probably I won't say I'm breathing, even if I am. But it's so normal, it's so basic, and also maybe saying that I'm sitting, is, I won't mention it. Okay, in one of my actions in in this moment. I will only select what I think is relevant, but maybe for you, some fears will be relevant, okay? Um, so I, we decide to make an interview. And so the first question is, uh, who are we going to interview? Uh, the idea of, of course uh, is uh, uh, target users. So a sample, not all of them, of course, because maybe they are millions. Uh, but some users that are in the target and also users that are uh, not directly involved but close to the target ones okay so the so-called stakeholders other people that have some kind of benefits from the system that we are designing but the most important ones of course are the users that are, that are going directly to use the system Maybe they can also be users or of a similar system. Okay, I'm trying to build a social network, new a new one, and of course the users of current social networks are very important to understand how they act, what actions they do, what they like, what they don't like, and so on. What are the difficulties and and, and something like that. Um, uh, or it may also be uh, non-users. So potential users, possible users, possible future users, but currently they are not using the system. Maybe they are they're using a similar system from the, from the competition, or uh, the product is so new that they are not using it anymore. So imagine when they introduced the, the smartwatches, okay? Uh, nobody was using them. The people had some experience with uh, normal watches. People had some experience with uh, uh maybe fitness trackers uh, but the real smart was 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 unknown didn't exist in, uh, initially so who are you going to interview well you're going to interview those people that you want to target the product for for maybe a given demographics a given people with some kind of uh, you know um, expenditure capability with some time of uh, work interest or with some time of fitness interest and so on and so you select the users that you would like to, to buy, uh, build a product for. Uh, and then you build a product that will satisfy those needs and try to sell it to, to those people, okay? This is the correct order. First, you select the, the users, then you design the product. It's not that uh, oh, this product is, oh, look, uh, this, um, is, uh, let's say, smartwatch has been bought uh, mainly from people in their, um, 20 and 30 years. Why is that? Well, because it was designed for that reason. The functionality were designed having in mind the needs and the desires of people maybe in that uh, in that uh, range uh, of ages. Hmm. So you, you don't, the mistake you don't want to do is to design a system with some features in mind and later on discover who is going to like these features. 
because maybe you can discover that nobody likes them or nobody likes all of them or uh, the group of users uh, are too fragmented because some like some of the features some other like some other the other features and then you cannot build a market for that because at the end of the day we need to sell the stuff okay we need to make money um and of course you can find if you cannot find uh, the, the the ideal users and you can you know find similar ones uh, similar users uh, uh from which of course you can you will get an approximate reply but uh, at least you can you can get to them okay and uh, never forget uh, that people will spend time with you will spend time for you and if you want them to to give honest replies to to think about what they're saying not just rushing an answer and so on um you have you must have some give them some motivation in the form of a small incentive from all of big incentives and gifts and uh, and uh, something like that they may be you know money services uh, you know five uh, five euros uh, to spend on amazon or whatever you want okay uh, so they in exchange for maybe one hour of their time in discussion with you um so uh, once you decided uh, the, the the people that you're going to interview and you got their you know, acceptance you know, you must schedule some time and place uh, take into account uh, the you know the, the needs of the users uh, it can be at your place it can be at their place a place depending of course doing going at, uh, at their place it's uh, um, uh, it's better for them but it will be more expensive for you it also depends on how many people are uh, you are surveying okay maybe if you're doing an in-person survey you will limit yourself to four or five people and if you are going uh, uh, an ongoing and um, one-to-one interview and if you're going an online survey maybe there are hundreds of people uh, so at the beginning of the interview you uh, explain your purpose it's very important that they they know and you have to tell them explicitly i'm not testing you I'm not giving you a mark, okay? I'm just asking you to help me. Okay, so they are, uh, you are not uh, uh, evaluating those people. You are not uh, grading them. You are not uh, judging them. Hmm? You are asking them to help you with their knowledge. So they should feel helpful. And so they, they should be feel that whatever they say, it's okay, it's right. Hmm? They don't need to give the, the right answer. But the right answer is the honest answer, is the real answer. But it's not that you don't have the right answer at the beginning. So you should make this clear so that people don't misunderstand your, your questions. And uh, start with questions that should be as much as possible unbiased. So you should not embed in the question some any hint any suggestion about what is the answer that you would like or the answer they would expect open questions so that they can respond freely uh, taking the direction they have in mind try and it is very difficult to write a question in this way which is not uh, uh, just a very open question like tell me what you want okay um, but the the trick is always asking people about themselves never telling about you never telling about your project or whatever they don't need they do need to know it's better if they don't know and if they can speak freely um, ask you the question and let them answer so there is not a time game we don't have a fixed time you don't need to reply in five seconds uh, you ask a question and people usually they will give you a reply and then if you stay silent, people will think about it for a moment and maybe they will add more. And this second reply often is more interesting than the first one, okay? Because they are reflecting to what they told you. Maybe they are asking themselves why or what did they say? Can you speak better? Okay, so no, uh, don't push the users to answer quickly or to give the, their, their definite answers. After all, an interview is just a structure for having a conversation. And the conversation should show should flow freely. You don't need to put times. Uh, they are not time sensitive questions. Okay, uh, so don't rush it anyway. 
uh, don't do it in, on the street by stopping people because we only get uh, rushed answers. Don't do that on the phone if you didn't plan for uh, and didn't schedule for the time uh, uh, beforehand. And so also you should also be clear at the beginning, okay, this interview is going to take 30 minutes, 20 minutes, 40 minutes, whatever. You should declare it at the beginning so that people know that this time will be allocated. You should keep it, you should not overrun it, but at least they are not trying to go away after five minutes or, or if they don't have 30 minutes they will say no at the beginning hmm? because otherwise the rushed responses are not uh, very useful for us hmm? and then after the answer is given okay, so I'm between... after the answer is given uh, you may uh, ask follow-up questions uh, so this, there, if there's something interesting that they say, that you can just ask them, uh, why did you say that? Could you elaborate a bit more? Can you tell me more about that point? Okay. Uh, I, again, never uh, judge questions. So I'm about, uh, oh, but I don't think that it's a good idea. It's not your job uh, to assess whether it's a good idea or not. It's just your job to, to understand them better. Okay. In this link, there are some resources that will help you with some examples uh, uh, of questions, for example. And um, what kind of questions should we ask? Hmm? Uh, we have, a, again, a trade-off uh, between uh, uh, the simple way and the deeper way. No? The simple way are structured questions. We have a question, some possible answers, and they only have to select. Then I have all the numbers and again and all the ticks, all the checkboxes, and they just have to analyze the numbers. Uh, it's very they are very easy to process. They can you can do them in hundreds of people, but uh, uh, they can only you can only get as much information as uh, you embedded initially in your questions. So you cannot discover anything new from a set of questions with closed answers. Because all the answers you already thought them uh, at the beginning, so uh, it's just a matter. In that case, you will only discover whether people tend more in one direction, the direction, or in a second direction. But the two directions were already in your mind. You will never find out that they are going in a third direction that you did you didn't think about at the beginning. While if the uh, interview is more unstructured with open questions. So they can speak freely, respond freely. Uh, you have more usually you have more comments, more information, and but the, this information is more qualitative. So you need to analyze it. You don't have the numbers right away. You need to analyze and see. Okay, this comment is relevant. This would be interesting, but it's out of my goal. It's out of my scope. It's from something else, and uh, and you need to filter them and analyze them. So there's more work. To process more information, but in this case, you are actually getting uh, you have the opportunity of, of having extra information, maybe that you didn't think about. Um, Open-ended questions with follow-up discussion is normally the suggested way of going. Okay, uh, and then uh, in the case you have some qualitative questions, uh, where you have a rate, for example, one, two, three, four, five. And uh, the, the scale from one to five as a name is called the Likert scale. Uh, if Since we are interviewing them in person, uh, if they give four, I try to ask them, what do you mean by four? Is, is it good enough? Is it very good for you? Uh, what, what could you do to make it a five? So what's the difference between four and five? And different people would just tell you, okay, I give you four, I gave you four because I never get five. So for me, four is the best. Other people will say, okay, uh, actually it's a two, but I gave a four because I don't want to be too bad, uh, but there's a lot of problems, so I cannot give a, a good score and so on. So it's more important, the, the explanation is more important than, than the raw numbers, okay? Um, and, uh, and so try to dig into practical issues, practical questions, not direct specific questions, not uh, uh, what, what would fill you 
make you feel better. It's not a question, okay, they can talk about anything, but you cannot extract a uh, direct uh, response. Uh, the more direct question is, uh, but in this task, uh, what is the, the, maybe in your experience, uh, the actions where you have more errors or, or more mistakes or where you spend more time on where you have more trouble uh, uh, collaborating with your uh, co-workers? And so some, some op it's an open question because they, think they can tell you anything but it's a specific, it's direct, it's concrete, okay? And of course, always ask the questions in the language of the user. So we don't use technology terms. We don't use uh, computer science terms. Uh, we should know, name the things with the, uh, with the same names, the same uh, yeah, names that the users are, are using for them. So that's, we already knew at the beginning that we, we first of all need to understand and to learn the language of the users. And if you are planning to do an interview with many users, uh, a good suggestion is always start with one or two as a beta test. Okay, test, uh, did you define the interview script? You will prepare the question, you will prepare what you're saying to your users. And uh, before starting for real, the interview um, campaign start with a small group. Maybe your coworker that maybe did, but he should not know anything about uh, your interview, but somebody from the office uh, uh, around the, the, the hall and say, do you have 20 minutes, please? I try to make an interview to you. And so that you can discover if any of these questions are not clear, if you are missing some important questions and so on while you're delivering it for the first time. You know, like, when we are writing software, first we need to debug it. So we try it on us for some time and maybe we give it to a friend that they will find the first, uh, the most important bugs and so on before we use it uh, on a larger set of people. Mm -hmm. And so again, uh, we are again talking about something which is not very expensive, okay? Just some time for some people. Uh, the good questions are always open-ended questions like, you know, here, tell me about you, your, your typical day. Uh, so describe me how your, your day is working. So from when you come to the office, uh, what you're doing and so on, uh, the main moment. And then while, while they're discussing, you can ask more questions to us more details about specific moments that they are telling you. Or tell me three good things about uh, something. Okay, about uh, some activity that you're doing, some device that you're using, and three bad things. So uh, what they like and what they don't like. Uh, but instead of asking what you like, which is a very open question, uh, in saying, okay, a good thing about this device. So you, you need to find a good thing and then the bad thing about that task, about that device, about that moment, about that activity. Um, if you are redesigning an application that they are using already, what has gone wrong? So tell me some story. People love to tell stories, always. If you let them talk their experiences and tell you about their experiences, especially if there were something where they had trouble, people really love to tell you about the troubles that had and maybe how they solve them. And this is very precious information because you want to do everything except repeating the same errors in the past. And uh, so they will tell you stories and then from these stories, you have to extract uh, what went wrong, okay? Maybe they have a perception that something went wrong, but then you can say, okay, if we fix it something in some other place, uh, that uh, situation will never happen. And uh, always uh, close your interview with a, uh, extra wildcard questions. Okay, is there in any questions I didn't ask you that you wanted to tell me? What new, what question did I forget? Hmm? So that they can actually add uh, whatever information they had in their mind they were trying to tell you, but you never asked about it. Hmm? So this should be always the, the, the last question. Is there, is there anything more that you want to tell us? Maybe, and again, here, give the, them time to respond. Hmm? Um, and on the other hand, there are bad questions. You should always avoid uh, to, to frame questions like this. No? Is a given feature important to you? Uh, if I'm asking it to you, okay, the answer is yes. 
you must answer yes to a question like this. You will never respond no. Huh? Uh, because I'm asking, so it's important for me and you want to please me. And so you will tell uh, yes. And then it's a feature important. You, know, uh, you, don't, you don't have anything to lose to say yes. Uh, and one more feature is always, always better than one less feature. Even if this feature is not, you don't really use it, but okay, if it's there, it cannot be worse, which is wrong, of course, but it's the normal thinking. I'm giving you something more. What do you think about that? Okay, give it to me, thank you. In the worst case, I'm not going to use it, but for me, it's okay. So uh, the answer to the question will always be yes, and you don't need to, <laughs> to, to ask for it. And again, it's, so, it's too technical because we are talking about a feature of a system that doesn't exist yet, or uh, it's not, this feature is not yet part of the experience of the user. So they're just answering randomly to please you. What you do, would you like in your tool? Okay, so you are using a software and say, okay, what are the functions that you're missing? Uh, what uh, new functionality are you asking to us? Uh, you cannot ask people what they want in your software because you are the software developer. You can ask people what they want in their work, in their task. So I would ask, what are the, the, the part of your task that you find difficult to implement with the tool? And so they will reply about their tasks. And then it's your job to integrate those tasks into the tool. You cannot ask that to the to the, per, uh, to the uh, individual persons, to the individual users, because they will, they are not able to understand uh, uh, the difficulty of a given implementation or how a given functionality would fit together with the others. It's your design uh, part. So uh, we never ask questions about the system, always ask questions about uh, the users. Hmm? That is what we are asking. Uh, what do you like in uh, this functionality? Uh, maybe the, I don't like anything at all. But if the question is, what do you like? I'm assuming that you like it. And so don't even try to tell me that you don't like it because you must like it. So that's a, a, a question that uh, the people will just try to uh, say something that they remember about this idea and they will never try, and it will never come out maybe that a lot of people are not liking this question. This, this, um, functionality or this system or what would you do imagine yourself uh, living on mars uh, what would you do for breakfast mm -hmm. and nonsense we, people cannot imagine being in a okay they can imagine it but uh, it's not their experience and so it's not what we want to understand this their imagination that can be more or less uh, you know fantastic but uh, uh, they are not giving us information uh, about how to help them in a specific situation. So uh, always try to uh, put the user into the familiar situation, uh, some situation where they, they are experienced, they have familiarity, and so they can respond also by motivating their responses on their personal experiences. Mm -hmm. um, and also difficult to do, to make, uh, um, quantitative questions to users, okay? Uh, if I am asking you, how many times uh, are you looking at your smartphone during a lecture? Most of you will say never, okay? Uh, or, or just uh, spit a random number because you don't know if it's five or 10 or 80 times. Really, we don't know, think about it. Uh, if we want to know, we can count it. So we can do an observation task. So if we, if the, this, this information is important to us, an interview is the wrong way of getting this information. We can just do make an, obs an observation and say, okay, uh, an observer that will count how many times you are picking your phone while you are in the class. At the at the end, you will have a number, which is an independent number measured uh, without uh, say, interfering with the person. But if you ask directly, mm, you don't get a reliable answer. We, 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 we really don't know. Hmm? We don't count what you are doing. We, we don't have you know, a, a linear memory. 
about uh, the actions that we do. And so we can observe or we can analyze maybe you know you can you have an application that is already running on the on the telephone and so you can pull this information from the application and then you have an objective measure don't try to get objective measures or statistics out of humans humans are not good at that um, and also a very um, no yes no questions binary questions uh do you like it yes or no in both cases you they can say yes they can say no but what you are really interested in is uh, why uh, why do you like it or why don't you like it so the yes or no response is less important than the why answer that you would like but if you're asking a question like this, people will just reply with a yes or no, and then we shut up. We will not try to motivate or to explain. And this is what we want to do. So always make questions that they give room for the people uh, to, to, to describe the reason of, of the answer, uh, what they did. Um, I, I want to tell you a, a story about one uh, practical experience that we had about uh, an interview that we did. And I think it's um, it's an interesting example of the of a result that we get that we got uh, that was totally different from what uh, we expected. Okay, uh, once we had um, a project uh, in which we worked with um, uh, let's say uh, a, a place uh, where some people with disability were hosted. Okay, and uh, so it's a place where there were some something like 20 persons with uh, with disabilities uh, they're what not autonomous some many of them were not autonomous in their in their movements some have had physical disabilities some had uh, uh, mental disabilities cognitive disabilities okay and uh, we wanted to 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 try uh, to there were, it was the first years in which the first smart watches was, were appearing okay so uh, our idea is uh, was uh, oh how can we exploit this new technology in that specific case in that specific domain, and so we organized a, a focus group so a group interview, so uh, and we gathered all the personnel of that uh, of that institution all the nurses and all the educators and the, the manager, and we had this focus group that lasted a couple of hours basically. And we really uh, we had uh, a lot of ideas in mind. Okay, uh, using the smart was to track lo the location of the persons, or to uh, give information, or to give notifications, or uh, you know uh, uh, many other fancy ideas that you can think of. Okay, um, actually, and, and we started with with that, this exact question. Okay, we asked the nurses. Okay, just tell us your typical day what are your activities and uh, we found that there are a lot of different activities like uh, uh, serving the meals uh, and helping them clean themselves uh, and uh, you know putting away their clothes uh, and giving them medications and something like that and okay for example for the giving medication then we asked uh, how do you do that how do you keep track of what medication you gave to to everybody and they showed us a good, uh, say, notebook with all of, with all, every patient, uh, the medication they need, the locker in which they kept the medications closed because they couldn't go away, or couldn't be stolen, and so on. So that was a very complex procedure, but they were happy with that. It worked well. It was not complex. It only needed them to keep track of the keys and on the notebook and so on. And so uh, many activities that for us, maybe they were um, potentially interesting for implementation. For them, they were not important. They were perfectly happy with uh, how it worked. Okay, and what we discovered it was a totally different problem they had, and they really made them anxious, and uh, and they felt every day uh, a problem for that. And the, that problem was a silly one, a simple, a much simpler one. And that case was. Uh, um, if a person or with disability had a problem and they wanted to call them, maybe they couldn't. So maybe they were on a wheelchair and they tripped down. They told us, 
again, anecdote that we tell you, they told us that some week before, one of their people uh, just with their, uh, with, their, um, uh, with their wheelchair went to the garden, it tripped over and uh, it, it, uh, no, it, went, it fell uh, on the ground. And the problem is that uh, he tried to call, to call them, but from the garden, the, the nurse that was inside and was doing their, their jobs could not hear him. And so they realized this only when uh, at the dinner time, when they went to search for the for this person that usually is, was you know, was able to move the, uh, himself, himself and and wh where is them? Where is he? Uh, and they they searched and they found him uh, two or three hours later. Okay, so this uh, something that worried them very much. Or if they say that during the night uh, there are only one nurse on guard, and they do rounds okay to check every half an hour every 30 minutes to check if everybody's okay and so there were the the problem was what happens if okay i i do the round and check that everybody's okay and then one minute later one of them one person is uh, feeling maybe having an attack there's a lot of people with the uh, epilepsy problems so they get the shaking attacks and when they have these shaking attacks they cannot uh, push the button for calling the nurse, okay? It's, a, it's an action they cannot physically do. And so they will find about this problem only 30 minutes later, and it will be very pain, painful for the person. So in that case, the, the, the problem, and there was a third problem saying, if I am, I, if, during the night, I am the only nurse, what happens if I feel bad, if I'm ill, if I trip down? So I, I will okay I will, I will have a problem but uh, all the all the all the guests in the house uh, will have nobody nobody to help them so uh, they were very uh, worried they could feel bad okay when they were alone because uh, how could they <clears throat> call their friends or their colleagues to come and help so basically what they wanted was an alerting system a system that with some very simple mechanism uh, so, for example, detecting highly shaking persons or uh, detecting a person which is uh, uh, still for too a long time or was stripped down and so falling detection, um, um, shaking detection, or a way for the nurse to push a button saying, okay, I need help, okay, because I'm not feeling well. So it's very, very, it was a very, a much simpler system that we could have imagined, but it was there their uh, real uh, concern. No? They were really uh, worried about these things uh, and, uh, and they insisted on that, okay? We could discover that only by, by letting them talk and, and explain. And, and when we saw that they were, they were tell, telling something that you know, was, uh, uh, was worrying them, we asked for more, for more information. So instead of uh, being prepared to do all the maybe drug management system uh, and all the tracking about the drugs and the barcodes and whatever you may think, nothing of that was useful for them. For them, okay, it was more useful a very simple, a much simpler system, but that was on focus with their specific needs. Okay, in that specific case, maybe some somewhere else the situation was different, uh, the organization was different, so the real needs were different ones. So I, I, I really remember this case, even it was uh, several years ago, because we came out uh, with a clear idea of what was needed uh, that was totally different uh, from whatever we had in mind before, which is a good, uh, say, example of the, of the kind of uh, uh, understanding of your user that you can get. Okay. Um, so I would be happy to see okay when you progress with your projects also how you discover some some information okay keep into mind that uh, the needs are in the mind of the users and not in the mind of the designers your goal is just to extract them without uh, trying to override them with your opinion uh, surveys uh, are a light form of interview in a way hmm? so that we can ask standardized questions so we can ask uh, open questions a bit because people are not going to write a lot of text into surveys uh, but more structured questions or closed uh, question with closed answers 
and we are fa all familiar with those. Uh, every now and then we have some friends that is going the, that is uh, you know, starting their thesis, uh, and they are asking you to go, oh, please uh, fill this questionnaire or this survey because it has will help me with my, with my thesis. Okay. And um, so it's very easy to to prepare. It's very easy to to deliver. Um, the problem, of course, is uh, to uh, prepare the good questions and analyze them in the right way. Uh, especially online surveys today are very common. Uh, they potentially have um, a very wide audience because you can distribute a survey to hundreds of people or thousands of people even. Uh, with, with no cost for you. And uh, then all the results come back and you could do some uh, some sort of statistical analysis, uh, compute the minimum, some maximum, the distribution, the average and whatever on the data. Um, uh, but of course, uh, uh, since there is no interaction between you and the respondent and the user, you should be extra careful with the settings, with the questions, uh, with, the po uh, with, the, with the answer that you are offering. Uh, because there is no opportunity for clarification there is no uh, second chance uh, you cannot uh, adjust the question if, if you feel that uh, okay when you are asking a question to a, to a person and you understand that they are they they understood the wrong question then for the second person you will modify the question you will correct the wrong formulation in this case it will not happen and uh, um, and uh, a mistake that we see very often is, is people that first write the questions, then uh, they get uh, um, um, some data, and then they try to extract some information from this data, which is the wrong way. Uh, first of all, uh, what we should decide is what do we want to know? What is the information that we need? And then we create the questions that will lead to this information. And it's more difficult, of course, because it requires more planning on our side. Uh, but uh, uh, you see maybe a lot of questions and then from the answer to the question, you cannot uh, uh, extract any meaningful information because they were unrelated questions and didn't have a, a direction, a plan. So start from the end. At the end, what are the three or four items that I'm interested in. Conceptual information, high level information. And how do I get these three or four uh, feedbacks from my users? And then I decide which question I should ask so that by combining the answers to this question, I can understand the given factor that I was uh, trying to, 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 to find, okay? So and not the other way around. Okay, the too much effort is made on discussing about the questions and not discussing about the results uh, that they will get with the questions. I see it every year, every semester when uh, the questionnaires from the teaching uh, courses uh, come out uh, and they see there are, you have these 19 questions or how many are there. Uh, we get the results uh, as teachers uh, and from reading these results, uh, we can only say, okay, it was a bit better or a bit worse than last year but we have no way of understanding why. Uh, it was this, was it the material, was it the teacher, was the, the the schedule because maybe it was late at night, uh, was the, were the technical problems, uh, were the exam too difficult? Uh, none of these important questions is there. So for example, I would, I would love to know for every course uh, if there is a topic uh, where I went too fast or if there is a topic that I, where I was too slow because it was easier. And the questioner doesn't ask for that. And so I don't have this information, which is the key information that it would have to improve. Of course, the Polytechnic would say that they have a very nice quality system where every year everything is controlled. They have numbers, they have charts, they have statistics. Yes, but it doesn't, uh, it's not uh, useful for improving the course, okay, for extracting from you, sorry, the users, uh, the information that we, the, the teachers, uh, are needing, okay. and so we need to have uh, extra um, tools. Uh, I would just to answer to the, to the question of Andrea, with asking uh, what is the difference between a survey and a written interview. Um, 
usually survey is made of uh, uh, closed questions. So question was uh, answers are on the scale one to five or closed answers and so on. And inter an interview is more, uh, say, um, discursive, more words and more text textual, okay? Um, but usually uh, you don't deliver written interviews online uh, because people tend not to write too much or if they write, uh, they go in, a, in many different directions. So having the, uh, an interview requires people to, to speak, to say a lot, uh, but you need to guide them in order to, 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 get, to get the information that you, know, that, that you need, okay? Because otherwise people start to complain about uh, the climate change, complain about the politics and whatever, and they, again, it's not useful. So usually we don't ask users to write a lot uh, Unless we are they are present, but and if we are present, usually we tend uh, to to ask them in, in in words. And also, if a person writes a long text, uh, they think about it too much. Okay, so they're trying to to again to please you or to or to des start designing what they what what they would like to have. Instead, we we don't know we don't want them to start about designing their response to their problems. We only want for the moment to understand what, what are their problems. So the written interview is not used very much in this in this context. Okay, so we tend to have a, a oral interviews, one to one or in focus groups, or surveys which are more quantitative with close answers or or short questions. So uh, written question when you have only a short text and not a long text to write. So that's why we call, we don't call them interviews. Uh, because uh, it's not a uh, you know, uh, free response, uh, but it's a sort of a, uh, say a guided uh, response force. Okay. Um, okay, thank you. Uh, risk and survey. Okay, they are very good for a shallow view of a large body of respondents, of course, so we can reach a lot of people, but uh, we are lacking the possibility of uh, doing deeper analysis, of course, uh, to asking why, to asking, uh, tell me more. It's impossible for the instrument doesn't allow that, of course. And uh, um, it's, we cannot ask follow up question unless, okay, in, in some questionnaires, uh, maybe you had at the end one chat box saying, do you want to be contacted for a follow up interview about what you answered? Yes, but it's very, you know, it's very complex, very costly, and only some people will, will reply. Uh, also, the, the distribution of the survey. Is, is a bit uh, dangerous because you are in a way pre-selecting the users. Okay, if you are, you know, distributing a, a survey over, I don't know, a mailing list or over Facebook, only those people in that mailing list or who have uh, your contact in some way on Facebook will have the potential to uh, to read your interview. And uh, of course, if you put a, if you get a sample of Facebook users and a sample of uh, um, Instagram users, they are different. They have different ages, different interests, and so it's very difficult to find a way of distributing the the, the questionnaire, the survey that is representative of your target users. So the risk is going to uh, getting a lot of users which have nothing to do with what you are trying to design. So that's difficult. Um, again, uh, uh, we should not uh, have biased responses, if, so we, we don't have, uh, uh, we should avoid questions uh, that are uh, more, they're relying on the user's memory, because people don't, don't remember exactly what they're doing, uh, or sensitive issues about uh, uh, how, do, how do you feel, uh, in an oral conversation, how do you feel is a normal question. Okay, how are you? Well, you start with how are you usually, okay? Uh, in a written question, people are much more uh, reluctant, reluctant to, to, to share their emotion or their feeling or their state. So usually we try to be more quantitative, quantitative objective in questions rather than uh, subjective. And so, uh, because we know that people don't respond well in that case, but of course we are leaving out the possibility, the, sh the chance of exploring that part. Um, this is telling us that probably the best way is doing a combination of both. Okay, some interviews we may be few people were selected in depth, 
and maybe if we have time also a wider uh, survey with a, a large number of, of, of people which uh, in which of course we can expect uh, less uh, detailed information especially not new information okay um, again how to design a structure a uh, survey uh, first of all, uh, we start always by declaring what is the purpose of the survey. Again, we are not evaluating you. We are getting information about uh, a new system, a new possibility, and the expected time. Okay, this survey is expected, so it's expected to take uh, five minutes, 20 minutes, whatever, so that people at the beginning, and be honest with this, okay? I saw a survey that said, okay, it only takes two minutes, and then it took 20, and uh, it's not fair to, to the users. And uh, it, if it happens, uh, you are estimating less time that it actually take, uh, takes, sorry, um, people will abandon the research. If you have 20 questions, they will reply to the first eight uh, and then they disconnect and say, oh, it's too long, it never finishes. And they go and do something else. Hmm? And um, so we, we need to, to balance this. Usually we have uh, different sections in a survey. So it's not a long sheet of questions, but different sections. Each one uh, explores a given topic and targets the question to some, uh, the question inside this section, okay? With a specific uh, uh, topics or area. Uh, we sh you should also ask, uh, usually in the last section, hmm, in the last section of the question, some information about the users. For example, um, uh, what is your age? Uh, what is your profession? What is your, uh, you know, uh, school level, and so on? If you need them, okay. So I uh, think uh, two questions, do two, two errors or two mistakes you need to uh, avoid. Don't ask personal information at the beginning. So if I go into a survey and if the first thing they ask me is what is your profession, where do you live, what is your age, I will close the pro the, the, the survey. Okay. Uh, ask me at the end not at the beginning, because it looks like you are profiling me. Hmm? And so I will feel uh, uh, not, not so well, uh, okay, uh, oriented about those people. And second, don't ask some information if you don't really need it. So do you really need to ask whether the user is a male or a female? What do we do with this information? Is it useful? Okay, if, if we know that it's useful, we can ask for it. But otherwise we are just asking information Okay, for the sake of asking, and people could get angry or could say, why do I need to provide you this information? I don't want, okay, it's not relevant. So only ask for the background information, uh, which is really relevant to you, not just for statistical purpose, okay? People already have too many, too, uh, too ma uh, many information, uh, data to, 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 to share, and we don't want to collect this data if it's not really needed. Uh, so what kind of background information could we ask? Uh, the, all the demographics, uh, these are all the possibility. It doesn't mean that we, we need uh, sorry, to ask all of them. We need to ask only those ones that are really relevant for us. If we are building a computer system, maybe it would be important, more important uh, to know their experience about the computers. How to use the computer? Do you use a computer every day? Yes, no, how much time for doing what? And this is important because the, uh, what they respond to the other questions could be interpreted by the, with the eyes of a non-expert person in computing and or uh, with the eye of an expert person in computing. And, uh, and so the answer will be different. We can understand the difference of the two possible user groups. Um, by the way, never confuse uh, experience with computers with experience in the job, okay? So I could be the best person in doing my job, but I really are um, uh, bad at using computers or the other way around, okay? So don't assume that uh, doing the job well means uh, doing the job well with the computer. Hmm? They are totally different categories. Um, Okay, we just some, uh, for example, uh, if we are redesigning some system, it would be interesting to know if they are using some of the features of the system or not. So are you using the, the you know, the print preview functionality that we have? Uh, I don't know, 
was it there i didn't know it was there i'm using it every day i use it and i don't like it and something like that so that especially maybe if you are trying to focus our attention on a part of the system uh, it's useful to understand how is that part is currently being used and this is an, inform is an information about the user no not about the system as always um, the open-ended questions of course are possible into online surveys uh, but uh, you should craft the question more carefully in order to have a specific response on the topic that you are asking uh, to avoid uh, answers that are too generic and then of course it will be no, it's not it's not very easy you know and there are methods for doing that we don't have time to, to study all of this um to for analyzing the responses so you read all the responses you mark the important words uh, you find the similarities and so on so that at the end you can extract uh, some valued information from a long list of answers and it's a, a manual process of course that you need to do or much easier are the closer than the question when you have one one uh, one possible choice uh, and um, it could be an, uh, some numbers from rank from one to five, like the number of stars or whatever, or uh, nominal values. So just uh, give me, tell me, you know, the the country where you're from, or what is the system, so operating system that you're using. Okay, the difference between ordinal values and nominal values is that in nominal values we have different alternatives, and there is no ordering between them they're all equally important you cannot sort them in any, in any way for example the gender male or female uh, there's no order in that there's just different possible values okay the country where you live different possible values there's no implicit ordering ordinal values are uh, values where something is there, there's an order relationship between them so for example, one to five, these are numbers, of course, or bad to good, bad, not so bad, not so good, very good, and so on. And uh, so they have different values, but they have a clear ordering from the lowest to the highest one. Okay, just the ordering, not the, the, num the numerical value. Okay, and uh, so these are different types of questions, not, try not to confuse them. And actually, from the statistical point of view, there are uh, really different data to be analyzed so if i have uh, some nominal values uh, for example the C gender city or whatever or, or course of enrollment uh, how are you how many of you are from computer science uh, some of you are from data science and so on um, what kind of statistics can, can we do we can only count fr frequencies basically it's okay count how many male and how many female, how many computer uh, engineers, how many electronic engineers, how many data science engineers. And we can just count them. Uh, we, there's no, no, you cannot do an average uh, of this, uh, of these uh, kind of measurements. Uh, on an ordinal scale, we have uh, distinct values uh, with a pretty fine ordering. So bad, not so bad, uh, average, a good very good for example uh, so we know which is better than which but we don't have any notion of distance here when you give five stars from one to five stars uh, the difference between one and two the difference between two and three and three and four and four and five are not the same they are not the same okay uh, you attribute different meaning the difference between uh, not so bad uh, and average and the difference between good and very good are not the same you cannot say they are the same probably they are just you, you know we, which one is better but you know you don't you cannot tell how much it is better okay by the way even the scores that you give you in the exam the difference between 18 and 19 or 18 and 20 is more than different between 28 and 30 and 30 even if there are two points in both cases but you know the meaning of the of the evaluation we know that 20 is better than 18 and 30 is better than 28 but the difference between 28 and 30 is usually smaller than the difference between 18 and 20 in in, in the evaluation so uh, even the scores from the university are just ordinal values they are not num real numbers okay 
So from, from this point of view, the American system with A to F is more transparent because it's explicit that we don't uh, we are not giving a number, but we are giving a, um, an order of, of magnitude. Okay. And so what happens is that uh, the statistics that you can extract uh, from an ordinal scale are uh, basically the ranking of the of, of the of the answers or the median value, but not the average values. Mm -hmm. um, from the mathematical point of view, it doesn't make many uh, it doesn't make any sense to add or subtract values where the distance between them is not defined, and the average means making all the additions of all of them. So you cannot mathematically do that in a meaningful way. So the average of the score of the university is a measure that from a statistical point of view, it makes no sense at all. And the average response in your questionnaire uh, at the end of the course, uh, we get that we have a score of 3.65, for example. It's an average of your scores doesn't mean anything statistically, okay? Uh, what would be more important are maybe um, the, the ranking and uh, the distribution itself. So it says, okay, 50% of the people responded good and 25% responded uh, quite good. And, and so that's, that's, it's important. So the, the, again, the frequency or the frequency in a given range. Okay, so we don't have, of course, uh, time to, do, <laughs> to dig too much into the statistics. But just for, for giving you an example of the importance of analyzing the data in the correct way. Okay, because otherwise you are getting a number, you're doing an average, and then you put a, a result out, and you can't interpret this result in a meaningful way. Hmm? Uh, of course, uh, uh, there are also other types of, of measurement, other types of scales. For example, uh, most uh, if you are asking for a real measurement, usually you, you are using these uh, ratio scales. Uh, um, where, uh, but in a survey, it rarely happens. Like when, you, when, you, when you're asking, how tall are you? So 185. Uh, this is a real number. Where well, there you can compute the average, the, the sigma, the, the, the standard deviation, and so on. Okay, and not in a, in the one to five stars uh, evaluate, evaluation. But it's very uh, unlikely that we are asking real numbers, quantitative questions to the users. Uh, sometimes you are asking uh, for absolute values. So how many people are there in your family? One, two, three, four, five. So this is an exact number. It's a number, um, but it's usually a, a, an integral number that just counts things. Uh, how many times are you doing that? How many people, how many cars do you have how many computers do you own and something like that so these are questions that may happen and these are easy to process of course okay um, but especially we must be uh, aware of the ordinal scales uh, and in particular there's one ordinal scale which is very often used is called so-called likert scales so if you want to make a question at least uh, read these articles uh, um, where we ask for we write a statement and ask the user how much does it agree does he agree about the statement and usually it's uh, in a four level scale like strongly disagree disagree agree or strongly agree or in some cases on the five level case uh, you know statisticians are arguing which one is better of course the four level doesn't have the middle uh, choice Okay, you cannot do. You cannot be neutral. You can. You must agree or disagree. While the first one has the neither agree or disagree, and so it's the, if you don't know what to answer, you have a uh, so a point that will attract your attention there and will attract your answers there. But also, it's more. There are more values. In some cases, uh, uh, so one to five is a range. In some other cases, they ask you one to nine, and responding on a value from one to nine about the agreement with a given statement is very difficult because, okay, is it a seven or an eight? Hmm? Uh, uh, what is the difference between seven and eight uh, uh, on the scale of agreement? Hmm? So it's the the small uh, difference between the numbers have no real significance, even because different people measure in different ways. So some people are stricter in their scores, so they will tend to go the left. Some people are more generous. 
and so and the statistical analysis when you are uh, you are you are trying to have a more finer scale your your risk is injecting too much noise there so uh, as much as possible we should try to make uh, you know, simple questions uh, uh, to uh, to extract information from the users uh, uh, to have simple questions with simple answers always avoiding uh, you know uh, bias and negative uh, responses and so on in in the questionnaire and uh, uh, so that we can you know uh, more easily analyze the data and separate uh, different type of, of responses that come uh, from different type of users uh, if we want uh, but we will come to this uh, much later in the course uh, uh, this you know people working in the user interaction already defined some set of uh, standard questionnaires we will use them for usability evaluation after we have a working system but this i just put this uh, here just to tell you that uh, we don't need to start from from scratch every time uh, uh, because uh, um, there's a lot of experience there are a lot of uh, templates that you can copy from uh, so don't use this case from need finding they are not for need finding but there are a lot of examples around uh, of a questionnaire, how we can structure it, and of course you can copy the general structure and then customize uh, your question for your specific needs. Okay, um, the time is over, but also the presentation is finished. So these more or less uh, are the main techniques uh, that we want to share with you about uh, uh, need finding, uh, uh, observation, uh, interviews, uh, and surveys basically are the three techniques uh, that uh, you are most likely to use uh, into this course. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I will close uh, uh, the class right now. And uh, uh, remember that tomorrow we have the first lab and it will be a fun one uh, because we are asking you to find uh, good and bad websites and, uh, and share them. And so we can analyze them together later in the course. Okay, so uh, thank uh, to all of you. And sorry if I went two minutes over my time. Um, uh, sorry, Enrico is asking if the lab will be online. Uh, yes, yes, we don't have the uh, Luigi wrote it yesterday on Slack. Um, we don't have the uh, permission yet to go into the lab. We hope for next week, but uh, you can never tell, okay, with our administration. So for this week, both uh, uh, terms, uh, the first and the second one, will all be online. Okay, check on the Slack uh, for, for all the details and uh, and uh, how, how the interaction will be done. Okay, so thanks to all of you and uh, see you next week. Bye-bye.